We started Mossy Earth all the way back in 2017. And in those days, the first project we tackled was to try to plant a forest to restore an area that had just burned down in a terrible wildfire. We arrived there a few days after the flames were extinguished, and I vividly remember the jet black ash and the 40 degree heat. This was a scorched landscape, and a truly desolate place, unlike anything I had ever seen. But in the following months, we put our backs into the work and spent countless hours on that mountainside, trying to plant thousands of saplings in the thin layer of charred, dusty soil that was left. And bit by bit, things started to look better. And now, six years later, I think it's finally time for a long overdue project update to show you how the area has been transformed, but also to reflect on what we've learned and how Mossy Earth has changed over the years. It's uh, really cool to be back here because uh, this is where it all started. This uh, was our first project at Mossy Earth and I'm really excited to see how this area has uh, transformed completely after the, the wildfire and especially our planting area up there um, because yeah, there was a lot of love and effort put into it. So I'm really curious to see how it looks like now. My idea for this video is to hike a short trail that climbs from the river to our planting area at the top. And along the way, I want to show you how each part of this valley has changed since the fire. I remember growing up seeing the fires on TV. It was a yearly occurrence, which didn't surprise anyone, but this year felt different. The raging fires consumed more area than any other year on record, and then they became deadly. In June, 66 people died in the Pedragon fires, 47 in one road alone. The worst day for wildfire deaths in the history of the country. Lessons were supposed to have been learned, but this was an unusually long summer, which left room for further mistakes. On the 30th of September, all fire watchmen left their towers, as was scheduled, as was planned, although it still hadn't rained, which meant the forests were at their driest and most dangerous point. The October fires started slowly spreading around the 13th, but then Hurricane Ophelia formed in the Atlantic and moved along offshore a few hundred kilometers off the coastline. It brought wind which fanned the flames, but tragically no rain as it never made landfall. And on the 15th, all hell broke loose. At one point during that day, there were more than 440 active fires in the country. Emblematic places that you learned about in school burned down, and once again people died bringing the death total for the season to more than 115 people. The scale of these fires was so immense that you could see them from space, and the smell of burnt wood reached Britain, which lies 1,000 kilometers to the north. And it was with this dreadful backdrop that me and Matt were starting Mossy Earth. It felt like the right moment to jump into action, but we also picked a project that truly challenged us to our core, and also our young organization, beyond what we were expecting for a first project. It was a true baptism by fire. Our connection to this project was Pedro, who at the time was leading ATN, a local conservation organization, and now leads Rewilding Portugal, whom we work with on some great rewilding projects. And the first thing he showed us was the edge of where the fire reached six years ago. And the reason why the fire stopped here is really interesting fire was coming uh, that way and it reached over this area about mid-afternoon like five, four, five, six o'clock and uh, it got stopped there because of the horses there. Pedro and his team at the time had some wild living horses in the area as part of a rewilding project and they saved this forest by essentially grazing down a lot of the bushes and grasses which meant the fire had less fuel available. So when the fire got to the border of that property it, it couldn't really spread much further so yeah, it's, it's nice to think that if we restored wild grazers to many of these areas, we would have a lot less problems with wildfires than we do now in, in this current situation. Now let's dive into the parts that burned and see how they've recovered. Before the fire, this area here had some lovely junipers and a few small trees that unfortunately burned down. And as you can see, they haven't managed to return. We found no real signs of their recovery. Instead, we have these plants called giesta or Portuguese broom. They're the pioneers of this region and will dominate this area here for a long time before any tree can find enough space to settle naturally. Yeah, I remember when we were here the first time, it, it looked like the moon, if, if the moon was black. Like the ash was just so dark. I mean, 
It was a bit like you walked into a fireplace. I mean, do you remember, Tom, how, how that felt? Like, it was also so, really so warm. It was one of those classic Portuguese days with 40 degree weather. Yeah, I, I remember it very well. It's almost unrecognizable. The voice you hear is Tom, who works with us as a videographer. But back then, he was not yet a part of Mossy Earth. He was just a friend who came along to take these beautiful photos. This first part of the trail descends to a river in a narrow valley. The fire actually managed to impact both sides of the stream here, but the temperatures must have been lower because a lot more survived here. Um, and here near the river, actually it was one of the places where when the fire first came through, it's, it didn't burn all the trees. And you can see that's where we still have some of the, some of the tall trees, uh, which are a mix, I think, of of ash mostly. It's looking really good now that uh, a lot of the other vegetation has come back. And with the new vegetation, we also saw the return of another species, the hiker. Normally, I'm not one for busy trails, but given how sad and empty the place was after the fire, this was really nice to see. As the trail switched back and climbed, I finally got to some areas that I had never seen before, with a different form of regeneration. I know these as shtivish, or in English, gum rock rose. They emit a lovely fragrance, especially when the sun comes out. And it always makes me feel like summer is just around the corner. And these hardy plants grow well in the harsh conditions of this valley. But as you can see, the same problem as before is present here. The trees have not recovered. You see, historically, a hill like this would have all kinds of oaks, junipers and wild olives. But grazing and other land uses have long blocked their recovery. And it was with this in mind that we decided to plant native trees in our area and try to create a pocket from which a forest could spread. And as we now rounded the corner, we finally caught a glimpse of our planting area, where we worked so hard all those years ago. Right after the fire, the temperatures still hit the 40s, so there was nothing to be done on the ground. And we instead focused on how to get the funding we needed to get those trees planted. We started Mossy Earth with about 300 euros between the two of us and built a simple website that could receive payments to plant trees. And then we got lucky. A company called Eliza Was Here decided to help us plant quite a few trees. And also Alex Honnold, you know, the guy who climbed El Cap without a rope in the free solo documentary. Well, he bought some trees with us and shared it on social media where he had a big following. And this got us a little bit more attention and also a little bit more funding. Suddenly, we had the money we needed to get this area planted and we started sourcing the trees. We got most of our tree stock from ATN's nursery and also from a few other ones in the region and we often had to resort to some rather unusual means of transport. Those rides were cold and grimy, but we were loving it because we finally got going. The species we picked were all native, such as the four oaks, juniper, wild olive, strawberry tree, hackberry, and among the water lines, willow and ash. To save the soil, we tried to spread some grass seeds, but when the first rain came, nothing really grew. So when we actually started planting, we had lost most of the soil, which made planting hard. And when I mean hard, I mean really hard. We were hitting rocks with every swing. Here you can see my friend Jordan quite literally bouncing back twice after smashing some rocks. I remember this being so constant that my hands would go numb and my back would hurt so much more than planting in another area. And yeah, then it began raining and the dusty ash and 40 degree heat turned to mud and cold dreary days. Planting was not a walk in the park, but bit by bit we got it done. And it was all thanks to the dedication and hard work of the amazing people that put their backs into this. From ATN, we had Nicola, an Italian forest engineer and Ze, a local field worker, and then we would bring bigger groups of our friends and family, such as Diogo, who later became our operations manager, and Tiago, who became one of our first conservation biologists. We reached our targets of 10,000 trees and then planted a few thousand more near the areas where the water runs in the winter. And I think by the time that we were done, we really had something we could be proud of. In spring, Nicola developed a water system that was coming from an old reservoir from a local farmer. And the goal with this was to help water the trees through the harsh summer months. But that 40 degree heat was something that always made us nervous. And with good reason. Okay, so now we can finally see our planting area. It's kind of rectangular, so it goes more or less from there all the way to that end there and then this way bit of an odd shape um, but it followed what we had available to plant and uh, 
yeah, I'm really curious to go there now and, and check out all the different trees. As we got closer to our area, we were presented with a familiar sight. Some old friends, soaring slowly in the warm afternoon thermals. They probably just finished an important cleanup job somewhere in the region, and are now heading back to base. The cliffs here are home to a large population of griffins, and it was wonderful to see them land gracefully back in their nests. But we also got a surprise visitor, a beautiful Egyptian vulture, which I had only seen a few times before. And actually, in 2018, when the trees were already planted, we did do a rewilding project with these vultures to help monitor their population here. You see, a year into our work, we started a monthly membership that allows people from all around the world to support our work to restore wild areas. This allows us to work on stuff which is much more complex and much more impactful than just planting trees. The ultimate bang for your buck of the nature restoration world. We still plant trees, of course, but these days our projects range from flooding forests to restore precious wetland habitats, to creating kelp forests in the sea which are a nursery for fish, all the way to weird but impactful ideas that usually go underfunded, like rewilding a quarry, translocating ground squirrels between airports, or saving for critically endangered species of snail that only live in one cliff on a deserted island in the middle of the Atlantic. To do all of this, we have our own team of biologists that research and implement these projects properly to maximize our small but impactful budget. And of course, transparency has always been at the center of all of this. Even back in the day, when we did this first project, we took a photo of every single tree on that hillside and then sent those photos to the people who paid for those trees. And nowadays, we keep our members up to date through videos like this one that you're watching right now, but also by sharing detailed project management documents, 360 degree photos, detailed maps, regular update posts and project podcasts with our biologists, a comprehensive transparency dashboard with all our actions, costs, and the cumulative impact we think we've had on ecosystems and species. And if you would have any questions after reading all of this stuff, you could always book a call with us or chat with us on Discord. The membership starts at the price of a pint of beer, but it goes a long way. So if you'd like to help bring back wilderness together with us, then please consider becoming a member at mossy.earth. The link is in the description and in a pinned comment down below. All right, now let's go see those trees. Well, last I checked, the survivors were along the areas which had the water lines. So that would be somewhere over there. All right, here's one, number one. It doesn't look great, but it is a tree. Um, let's see what else we can find. All right, we've got another one right here. This little guy, also a bit shaded, but looking really great and healthy. Uh, I've got another one right here. This one's a little bit taller, not yet enough to, to do, yeah, to have a bit of shade in the summer, but uh, it's looking really, really great. Like a, another one right here, and another one right here, and another one right there. These ones are looking great. Look at this guy right here, yeah. They are everywhere actually in this area and this is the area that we focused on a bit more with the uh, irrigation. Oh, there's a really tall one. So this might be one of our tallest trees here, which, you know, it's quite a bit of growth for, uh, for an oak. I and mean, look at this. This one you could certainly get a little bit of shade on. <laughs> if, uh, if the weather was right and the sun was coming from the right direction, you might say you can sit under the shade of your own tree just really cool very 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 happy with the results actually this is our first project super cool so how many trees actually survived the harsh summer and the years since then well in the areas with water most of them did and in the areas where we left them alone few or none survived of course this was due to some limitations on the size of our irrigation system and overall, we estimate that around 1,000 trees survived from this first batch. Of course, we've done some replanting over the years, but at the time, we needed to plant a tree for every single contribution we had received. So we hedged our risk and used the leftover money to plant 10,000 extra trees as a backup project in the Carpathian Mountains, where growing them is really easy compared to this dry, dry, challenging location. 
This way, those early customers actually got these trees as a bonus. Last six years have been yeah, really crazy and I'm so happy with the things we have achieved. And a project like this one, which was our first one, were challenging and were, were, were very difficult to implement. And that's why only 10% of, of the trees survived. But I'm still really happy and proud that we did this and, and still really happy and proud of the results. And um, yeah, that fills me with this joy to, to look back at what we've done. But above all, what I'm really excited for is for what we are doing now and for what is to come. And that part is all about you. Uh, our audience on YouTube, of course, but above all, our Mossy Earth members that make all of this work possible through your contributions and through supporting us also emotionally. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what's coming. And if you'd like to be a part of this and maybe, you know, in six years time, this might be a tree that you've helped plant and uh, we might sit together under the shade of that tree. Um, then yeah, please consider becoming a Mossy Earth member and you can do so at mossy.earth. Until next time. Cheers. <laughs>